1895, I ended up having to do something I had sworn to never do again, and whose very thought was detestable to me. Embarking once again on a lengthy lecture tour. I had hoped to avoid the lecture platform for the rest of my life, at least as far as extended tours were concerned. The time on stage I didn't mind, but the enjoyment that part of the enterprise brought me no longer compensated for the dreary traveling and the disruptions to my comfortable routine and family life. Yet our finances were in such poor shape that I saw no other way out. In order to pay off our debts, I must again mount the platform and yell into the vast, dark recesses. So I resolved to canvass the Earth's populace yearning for education at my stand and, at the end of it all, write a book about the trip and its points and matters of interest and thus escape the Wall Street bondsman's lash. So I would spend a year girdling the globe from the summer of 1895 to the same time a year later. I would make a return visit to the West and to the Sandwich Islands. I would see parts of the British Empire I had never seen before, such as Australia and New Zealand and India. Livy was to accompany me and also Clara. Susie and Jean opted to remain at home. It would be hard for the family to be separated for such a long time, but it needed to be done for us to get back on a solid financial footing, meaning most particularly to pay off our creditors in full dollar for dollar. It is ironic that as a boy I had wanted to be a clown in a circus painting my face and cavorting around the stage. And now here I was about to do that very thing long after the desire to make myself conspicuous in that way had withered away. But to earn the money necessary to pay off our debts was the respectable thing to do and the only way Livy would have it. Honor is a harder master than the law. It knows no statute of limitations. Truth be told, and this is my final opportunity to do that, I would have been happy to pay 50 cents on the dollar, a deal that Rogers and I were able to work out with my creditors, as I did not really feel personally responsible for all of those debts. Much of those obligations were due to the poor or even criminally negligent or deliberately criminal actions of Webster during his mismanagement of my affairs and the treacheries of that ass page. But when my nephew and namesake Samuel Moffat put those lofty words about honor knowing no statute of limitations into my mouth in an interview he wrote for his paper, and Livy saw it, she found it such a fine sentiment that she was adamant that we pay the full amount of our debts, whether such burden should rightly fall to us or not. In hindsight, I'm glad that we did end up paying the debts in full because it made her happy and content. It still burns me, though, when I think of those blatherskites and the pain and misery they put us through. Still, it was not a totally ill wind that blew us abroad. We all enjoyed it at intervals, and we all benefited at times. One way was due to the fact that travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. Broad, wholesome, charitable views of men and things cannot be acquired by vegetating in one little corner of the earth all one's lifetime. 
And sometimes we who have traveled need a refresher course in those lessons. As to that, I have no race prejudices, and I think I have no color prejudices, nor caste prejudices, nor creed prejudices. Indeed, I know it. I can stand any society. All that I care to know is that a man is a human being. That is enough for me. It can't be any worse. Finally, the seasons of toil were up. After a full year of raids made upon audiences in Australia, New Zealand, India, South Africa, and other places along the route, we were able to settle down once again. But then, the worst event of my life, up to that time at any rate, occurred. <laughs> 